Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming uh, to our Vital Voices session. Let me just give you, uh, my name is Stephen Villano, and I am the director of the Center for Public Service and Community Research, and I'm the fellow who puts the, together these Vital Voices sessions. So let me just give you a, a little um, introduction here. The Wall Street Journal recently ranked UHD, the home of the Gators, as one of the best colleges in the United States, along being number one for diversity and number th three for student experience. UHD was ranked number 224 out of the top 400 best colleges in America in the Wall Street Journal recent announcement of 2024 college rankings. UHD also scored the highest alongside Kentucky's Berea College in terms of diversity. So only 23 Texas colleges and universities in total made the top 400 with the University of Houston at 208 and UHD at 204. So we're doing pretty good. So uh, I want to welcome you again to Vital Voices. As you may know, Vital Voices serves as a forum to bring the UH community, UHD community scholars and practitioners who work on issues vital to the functioning of our democracy. Our guests speak from their professional experiences and expertise about their work and how it impacts society. Vital Voices' purpose is to showcase individuals whose work is interdisciplinary between criminal justice, social work, and education, and uh, touches upon those fields. Over the years, we've explored subjects such as addiction, youth in the criminal justice system, homelessness, reducing recidivism, the graying of America, uh, how social work impacts immigration, school violence, uh, tackling the silent epidemic of childhood grief and trauma, bail reform, uh, mental health providers, everybody. Um, we, we, we've covered all of those subject, subjects because all of those topics are important to the disciplines we offer here at the College of Public Service. So I am going to turn the microphone over now to Dr. Beth Gilmore, who is an associate professor in the criminal justice department here at the University of Houston downtown, and who is responsible, primarily responsible for bringing our esteemed guests on this panel here today. Dr. Gilmore. Thank you so much. Um, so again, welcome everyone. Um, we're excited to have you all here. And uh, one of the things that uh, I often get asked in the classroom um, from our students is what happens when a child makes an outcry of abuse? And who is responsible for assuring that um, that case is fully investigated? And I've come to realize that unless you're kind of in this field, unless you're actively doing this work, you may not realize all of the various professionals that are responsible for assuring that when a child makes an outcry that they have been abused, that the case is investigated fully and completely to completion. And it takes a team of people. It takes a team of experts with varying expertise and training and background and knowledge to assure that these cases are fully investigated. I'm really glad that everyone is here joining us today, uh, and for those of you who are joining us online as well, because one of the things that's really eye-opening is to learn that when a child uh, makes an outcry of abuse, all of the different professionals that come into contact with the child and all of the different ways that those professionals operate, both um, independently for the things that they do that are required of their position, but also cooperatively as a team. So the individuals that you see before you make up what we call in this realm the multidisciplinary team. And what that means is that they all have different training and various expertise in how to investigate and how to best collaborate to assure that a child that makes an outcry of abuse is, um, gets the full amount of services that they can possibly receive. And what you're going to hear today, and this is, this is kind of a neat fact, and we're going to let them do the talking because they're the ones that are doing the work. Um, I asked them prior to the start of the panel to tell me how long they had been working with child abuse victims. And you have in front of you, in your panel, over 135 years collectively of child abuse investigation experience, which is... Uh, kind of overwhelming when you think about it, right, in terms of knowledge and expertise. So um, we're going to hear from each of these panelists. They're going to introduce themselves to you. 
They're going to tell you what they do and what that means. Um, There's some acronyms that you kind of hear oftentimes in child abuse, things like the MDT, that's our multidisciplinary team, or what ICAC is. Um, and you'll hear from them kind of what they do, uh, where they work, the agency that they work for, and how they play a role in this team. Um, and so they're going to kind of explain what they do and how they play a role in the team. And then what we're going to do is we're going to open this panel up for questions. Because oftentimes, until you have the opportunity to interact with these professionals and ask them questions, things may be really um, kind of confusing or not quite clear. And so we're here to answer your questions so that you can kind of understand um, how this works. And I think this is particularly something that resonates with our a student population, whether you are a criminal justice major and you're someone who might choose one of these as a profession in the future, or you are a social work student and you may choose one of these professions as one of your chosen professions in the future. If you're an urban ed major, and I know we have uh, some in here and some that are coming in a little bit later, um, you know, oftentimes I will tell you as someone who used to work with child abuse victims, children may not tell their parent or caregiver that they've been victimized. They'll tell a teacher or a coach or someone at their school. And so you may be the outcry um, witness to a child victim. You may be their trusted person that they can come to. And understanding best how this system works will surely help you grow and develop as a professional. So um, again, welcome. As you're thinking of questions, you can feel free to write them down. Um, if you're online, you can put them in the chat and we'll go back through and look for questions. Um, but I'm going to let you hear from our panelists because um, I think that learning from people that are doing the work is one of the most valuable experiences that you can ever have um, when you interact with professionals. So. Uh, well, help me in welcoming our panel. Um, I think we're going to start. Would, would be okay if we start over here? Okay, so if you came to our event last night, you're familiar with these two uh, gentlemen, or if you online streamed with us. Um, so we're going to start over here with Tony. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Tony Godwin. I'm a detective with the Garland Police Department, which is uh, kind of the northeast corner of Dallas and my city touch. I've been a police officer for 30 years. I've been in law enforcement for 35 years, and I'm on the Northern Texas Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. I've been on the ICAC task force for 18 of my 30 years, uh, and I started in that capacity as a case-carrying detective with hands-on, primarily hands-on, uh, physical and sexual abuse of children, and it's sort of morphed after a couple of years into ICAC, uh, which generally means anything that involves a, a cell phone, a computer, a gaming system, and a child, and something on the web, uh, that falls under my purview. I, I primarily, at this point in my career, um, I only do mostly proactive investigations where I'm uh, the sexiest 12-year-old girl online, I promise you. And uh, I chat, and that's primarily all I do between that and cyber tips. Um, I'm also half of uh, the Catfish Cops podcast. You'll hear from my partner here on that, and it's just something we do to raise awareness in public education um, as well as tell a couple of cool stories. So thank you for having me. I am the other half of the Catfish Cops podcast. Uh, which we started in 2020 as a way to educate uh, the community uh, about these crimes, specifically in the online child exploitation world. We saw a great need for parental education and empowering children to protect themselves online um, so that we could at least make a, a dent in the effort to stop online exploitation. So my name is Brandon Poor. I have been a police officer at the Grand Prairie Police Department for the last 18 years. And the last 10 of those I've spent in the Crimes Against Children. And then I created in 2016 our Internet Crimes Against Children unit. So I started the first two years of my, my time in Crimes Against Children working the hands-on cases of physical sexual abuse, um, child death and homicide cases. I was speaking earlier, we had three child homicide capital murder cases within six months of each other in 2016. So there was not a lot of sleep that year and that's why I've lost all my hair and I look like this. Um, and uh, But since then I have worked online child exploitation cases, specifically what we used to call child pornography, now child sexual abuse material cases. 
um, uh, internet crimes against children that, that in deal with this online solicitation and enticement of children, and then our cyber tips. Um, and I'm assigned full-time to a federal task force that just means that we're investigating those crimes all across North Texas, um, both state, locally, and federally. And then for the last seven years, I have been a digital forensic examiner examining cell phones and, and computers for the crimes that we investigate in how they do what they do on those devices. I'm going to jump in real quick. Um, just, um, I apologize real quick. I just, two things really quick. Um, one is that uh, we got a lot of questions last night as a follow-up after, um, after you both spoke um, about their podcast, in particular a victim that they were speaking about and a case that they were speaking about. Um, if you could both, if you could just remind everyone where they can find your podcast information, because there was a lot of questions about the Carly Ryan Foundation, um, as and I, I know just from listening to your um, to the information you put out in terms of prevention and awareness on your podcast that you have a special episode for that. It's kind of easily findable on your website. So if you could just you know, tell everyone that information before I forget. Um, and then also, um, if you can just explain what ICAC means, and I know we have we have Freddie down here too who's gonna explain ICAC, but if you can just help people understand what that acronym is too. Okay. Yeah, so our podcast is the Catfish Cops podcast we started, uh, and that you can find that on any place you find your podcast, Apple, Google, Spotify. Um, but you can go to our website, which is catfishcops.com, and we specifically created our resources page of our website to be a one-stop shop. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel, but we wanted a place where if someone said, I don't know much about this field, where could I go to learn about it? Where could I go to get resources? Where can I go to find out what this application is? How do I know what Discord is or TikTok or Snapchat? Or how do I make my child's device safer using these applications that all these kids have? They're all there in the resources page, as long with a lot of organizations that do this work, the research that we talk about, specialists in psychology and offender dynamics. Um, they're all there in that place. And then within that, uh, the Carly Ryan Foundation that we mentioned and spoke about last night has graciously offered their resources to that. We link directly to their page. And Sonia, a dear friend um, and sort of a sister to us, the, the much more beautiful third party of this, this trio, um, she has uh, been on our podcast in several episodes, three episodes, where we talk specifically about Carly's case and then her work in the child advocacy field um, through the last 10 years, 20, 10 or 12 years. Um, and then Internet Crimes Against Children is an umbrella term that encompasses all of the factors of online child exploitation. So the ICAC idea was the... was. As we said last night, we're the only ones in our departments doing this work. Um, some of the larger departments like, like Houston have a few more uh, investigators in their units. But for those departments that either don't have Internet Crimes Against Children units or only have one, the idea was we create task forces full of members of multiple agencies that come together and work these as a team so that if I have a case that I need to go serve a warrant and it's just me, I can call on Tony and we have about 15 other colleagues that we call on very frequently to come together, serve a warrant, search for the items that we're looking for, interview offenders, do forensics, and then file the cases so that they get prosecuted properly. Uh, and then there's a national ICAC that's, that oversees and sets our policies and standards in place so that we do this work safely, effectively, and in the most efficacious way possible. Good morning. Um, my name is Marion Reed. I am the Special Investigations Program Director over Human Trafficking and Missing Person for Region 6. Um, which is the southeast area of Texas for Texas Department of Family Protective Services. Um, most commonly, um, most people know of CPS. Um, most people hear CPS. Um, 
However, the Department of Family Protective Services is multifaceted. They have different divisions. Um, and I happen to be that division of special investigations over human trafficking and missing persons. Um, special investigators are, um, we are current and former law enforcement officers who have crossed the lines into child protective services to act not only as the liaison for law enforcement, but to also bridge the gap between child protective services and law enforcement. Um, Commonly, um, we speak different languages. Um, the acronyms are often different, and so we help to bridge that gap. Um, me, myself, um, my entire law enforcement career um, has been here in Houston um, starting in 2001, so just under, um, just under um, 25 years in law enforcement completely. However, um, 20 have been working with child victims. Um, and in 20, 2016, I took a position and became the special investigator at the Dallas Children's Advocacy Center in Dallas, Texas, where I was over all of the human trafficking and all of the child fatalities. Um, in 2020, I, um, I wanted to come back home. So I, I am a Houstonian to heart. So I um, applied and I promoted to Special Investigations Program Director. Um, in 2021, August 2021, um, I created the first ever division of special investigators, the unit that only covers missing person and human trafficking. We are the only ones in the entire state of Texas. So um, we are kind of the pilot program and um, we cover uh, Houston, the Harris County proper, as well as the surrounding 12 counties. So we touch all of those human trafficking cases and all of those missing person cases um, that come through the Department of Family Protective Services. On a daily basis, we um, obtain cases that are called into our statewide intake number um, pertaining to any type of human trafficking that involves sex trafficking of a child, uh, labor trafficking of a child, or forced labor of a child. Um, so we touch all of those cases in the area that covers just over 8 million people. So we're just a little bit busy. Um, I actually have a team of 11 investigators that does all of that work. Um, we investigate, not only do we um, go in, of course, sometimes it's swiftly, but we make sure that we coordinate with law enforcement to ensure that the investigation is not only um, we not only gather the information and assist law enforcement in ensuring that they properly gather um, information for their criminal uh, investigation, but we also ensure that our investigation is trauma-informed and victim-centered. Good morning, my name is Misty Gomez. I am a social worker, a family advocate at the Children Assessment Center here in Houston. Our role as family advocates is really to assist families and support them navigating the many systems that respond to a report of child abuse. The focus really of advocacy is to help support, educate, and guide caregivers in the aftermath of crisis and trauma. As well, we provide assistance with information and services and um, help them in the pursuit of healing and justice. We work as a multidisciplinary team with law enforcement, Department of Family Services, forensic interviewers, and family advocates. During a case, there's usually pre-staffing and as a family advocate, you get to meet with the caregiver where you have a one-on-one -on -one session. During that session, um, a caregiver really gets the time that they need to process and talk about this traumatic event that their child has been through. And after that, we get to post staff as well with the partners, whether it be law enforcement and Department of Family Services. But it is important to note that the more positive that that session is with the caregiver where you are able to meet them where they're at, the better that they are able to support and guide their child through this traumatic event.
Good morning, everyone. It is so nice to see each of your faces because I once stood in a chair like yours wanting to know about how to help children and how to help others. My name is Claudia Gonzalez and I am the Director of Forensic Services at the Children's Assessment Center. Who here has ever heard of an advocacy center? Yep, it's not commonly known, but it should be. And you sitting in that chair helps us spread the word and helps unite us as future colleagues because it takes a wide effort to help those in need, particularly child victims of abuse and their families who are going through a very tumultuous time and need as much support. And what support means is true collaboration from the moment of investigation through the rest of the time that a child needs to really heal and overcome this experience of potential abuse that they have gone through. As a organization, everyone has goals. Everyone has a mission to follow. And the mission of the Children's Assessment Center in Harris County is to provide a professional, compassionate, and coordinated approach to the treatment of sexually abused children and their families, but also to advocate for all children in the community, not just those that are experiencing or have experienced abuse. When a report is generated and there is a potential allegation of a child being a victim of abuse or witnessing abuse, our partners, law enforcement or child protective services, one of their initial approaches is to refer to the advocacy center. We help bring everyone together at one location where families can come to one place and know that that is where their services can happen and they don't have to go in multiple different places. When the case is first refer, refer to the CAC, the first service available for families is a forensic interview. Who in here has ever heard of a forensic interview? A little more, okay, that's progress. So I am a trained forensic interviewer and a forensic interview is a very complex task. Why? Because that is the moment that a child comes in and is provided with a child-friendly setting. There are cameras in the room. And what it is, it is a neutral, fact-finding conversation between a competently trained adult that maximizes a child's ability to narrate a possible experience. And without pressure and without any expectation. It is our role as forensic interviewers to maximize a child's competence by allowing them to freely speak, but also understand what the expectation is in that forensic interview room. The gold standard has always been one interview. Let's not further traumatize a child who has already taken a leap of faith and asked for help, or has never asked for help, but someone witnessed the abuse and now we're expecting them to come in and disclose abuse. The investigation from the beginning is collaborative in nature. As you heard from Misty, when the family comes in for that forensic interview, we conduct a pre-staffing as a case team. What is the case team? The case team is composed of that Child Protective Services caseworker, that law enforcement investigator, the trained forensic interviewer, and the family advocate. That is the opportunity where we all understand what has been reported, and what is the allegation, who has talked to who, has there been any medical intervention, has the child disclosed to a professional. All of the facts of the case can be utilized in that forensic interview to help and assist a child disclose abuse if they are ready. But as advocates, we also educate our partners that not every child is in a stage of actively and willing to disclose the details of their victimization. Re research tells us that anywhere between 60 to 80% of children do not disclose their victimization until adulthood. That's an astounding number. However, what can we do as a professional to help facilitate that if something has happened. Because as a neutral party, we have to keep into account that a reported allegation is just that initially, an allegation. What facts do we know of the case? In that interview, 
will help determine or help assist the investigators what should happen next in their investigation, whether it's to proceed, whether it's that a medical needs to happen, whether it's to close out the investigation because there is no evidence that abuse has occurred. The stakes are really high. And what I always tell my team of uh, in forensic services is that the investigation does not rest on the forensic interview. That's too high of a stake to put the pressure on a child in that manner. This is one piece of the puzzle and further how we collaborate together as a team to facilitate the investigation, but most importantly, to prioritize the need of the child in front of us. In forensic services, which is the division that I help lead, we are a team of 25 professionals of forensic interviewers, family advocates, and most recently we opened a program called clinical assessments where after the child comes in for the forensic interview, we know we must refer for mental health treatment to truly facilitate their healing process. However, children are very resilient and not everyone needs to sit on a wait list of therapy. So how do we understand not what has happened to the child, because we already know that from the forensic interview or the investigation, but how is the experience of trauma impacting that child and that family? And should they be referred now for individual, for group, or any other type of evidence-based trauma treatment that is also offered at the Children's Assessment Center through the therapy and psychological services? That is the skinny of the services that we provide as an advocacy center. The beauty of this is not only the collaboration, but the availability of resources for the families who really don't understand a system with multiple partners could be quite complex. We help bring in some calm to the storm. We help bring in some clarity to the unknown. We help stabilize it, but also empower that families have a say, that families are supported and that we are here to help them for the rest of their life with whatever it is that they need. If a child comes to therapy and successfully graduates because they've met their treatment goals, and years down the, the road, they understand their trauma in a different manner, that trauma symptoms are coming up, they are always welcome to call us back as an agency to be able to come back and receive trauma services at that point as well. And that is how you as students can know that any case that happens in Harris County, even nationwide, because it, this effort, this advocacy movement is bigger than just us in Harris County. We are one of over 900 CACs in the United States, but we are all here for the same mission and the same purpose to really help sustain a family in a time of uncertainty. Thank you. There we go. All right. Try not to blow y'all's ears out. My name is Freddie Croft. I am the lieutenant with the Houston Police Department's ICAC unit. Um, our unit is made up of six investigators, one cyber tip analyst, and myself, and a sergeant. Um, but in that role with the HPD's ICAC unit, I also serve as the Houston Metro ICAC Task Force Commander. And as uh, Tony and Brandon down there mentioned, uh, the Federal Task Force uh, Houston is the lead agency for the, the Houston Metro ICAC Task Force, which is made up of Harris County and the surrounding counties. So uh, just to give a little backstory on how that works, the, the Department of Justice breaks the United States into different areas uh, for routing resources and um, cases so that they are able to be investigated within their jurisdictions. And uh, the Houston Metro, Texas is broken into three task forces. Uh, North Texas ICAC is run by Dallas PD. And they pretty much, if you take Texas and cut it across the, the you know, horizontal line, they take everything along that line and above. The Attorney General's office out of Austin manages everything south of it. And because of our population density and the amount of cases that we get here in Harris County, the surrounding counties, uh, we have our own small little task force right here that um, has about the same workload as the other two task force. I think they're a little bit higher than us, but it's within you know a few percents. Um, so in that role, uh, HPD, we're pretty much reactive only cases. They mentioned they do proactive cases, which is going online, chatting with um, people that are looking to exploit children. Uh, HPD, we do reactive cases, and I mentioned cyber tips, and they mentioned cyber tips, and what those are is we get any case that somebody reports to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children through their uh, cyber tip line, those get routed to the different task forces based on where the incident happened. 
and Houston is the clearinghouse for those cases. Uh, just to give you a little perspective on how prevalent this type of stuff is, uh, in 2019, we saw about 3,500 cases across the Houston area um, for ICAC-related incidents. This year, and I'm think, I think they're actually higher than us, but this year we're on pace for about 22,000 cases reported to us. So uh, with our task force, we're made up of about 80 agencies, um, you know, made up of law enforcement, nonprofits, our partners like the CAC, um, uh, other nonprofits like Texas Center for the Missing. And my role within that task force is to coordinate the resources that are provided to us through the federal government and onboarding new agencies, providing equipment and training to different officers that need it, um, getting more officers involved in these type of cases, more agencies involved in these type of cases, because unfortunately some of the uh, different law enforcement agencies don't see these as a big priority. They think that you know these, these are just things that are happening by the by and it, there's nothing that you know they can do about it or there's other pressing matters, but um, as we know, you know these are these are big cases that affect a lot of people in different ways. Um, we've seen a huge intake or uptick in the amount of cases that are actually reported against college-age students. You all, um, with cases that we call sextortion, which is basically online online blackmail of people for their illicit photos. Um, I'm sure if you're here at at a campus, you've probably heard of it, uh, and it's it's grown in prevalence and sophistication over the years. So, uh, I only have about a year and a half in this role. So, with that 135 years, I don't make up much of that, but uh, I have been in law enforcement for about 13 years in different roles within HPD. I've been on our gang task force. I was an investigator with our adult sex crimes, um, worked in IT for a little bit with our department. So I have a, a wide range of experience within the department, but um, I'm semi-new to this and uh, happy to be here. And thank you all for being here as well. So, Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Denise Nichols. I am an assistant district attorney for Harris County. That means I'm a prosecutor. I prosecute criminal cases is kind of what I do. Um, our office is huge, and we handle criminal cases that are everything from shoplifting at Walmart to capital murder. Um, we do have specialized divisions within our office that focus on specific types of crimes. Um, I am the division chief of the Crimes Against Children division at the Harris County DA's office. On a daily basis, all we prosecute is cases where children are alleging that they've been sexually abused. To give you an idea of what that work looks like for us, we currently have about 3,600 cases that we're prosecuting. So when we talk about something like child sexual abuse, it's obviously something that touches people in all areas of our society. Um, I am a member of the CAC of Texas Statewide Task Force on Child Sexual Abuse. Um, I supervise 10 attorneys who work in the 24 district courts, about to be 27 district courts in Harris County, Texas. And um, it kind of makes sense that I am last because we are kind of the last step in the MDT. My job as a prosecutor is to take all of the good work that all of these folks have done, try to put it all together and see if I can prosecute somebody who I believe has molested or abused a child. Um, we work very closely with Children's Protective Services, certainly law enforcement. Um, we try to help whenever we can. So frequently we have um, situations where law enforcement might be investigating a case they need a search warrant to go into somebody's phone. We'll help them write that search warrant and make sure that it gets filed. They might need records. We'll help them do a grand jury subpoena or another kind of subpoena so that we can get those records. Sometimes we have witnesses who aren't very willing to cooperate. So we might bring those witnesses in front of a grand jury to get the information that we need from them um, to make our cases. We also, within my division at the DA's office, we have our kind of own little mini multidisciplinary team because we have two investigators who work solely on our cases. We have two social workers who are there to provide continuing support to our survivors and their families. We have paralegals, admins, everybody that we can put together as a team to work these cases. Um, I've been working these cases in various roles for 23 years, and I can tell you that the cooperation that comes from this multidisciplinary team 
not only gives better results for the survivors, but it certainly makes my cases much stronger when I am able to prosecute somebody and take them, put their case in front of a jury, and hopefully get them held responsible for the crimes that they've committed. Okay, so um, starting back up, I have a couple questions that um, I was hoping that we could we could kind of uh, get clarified that came up in the online chat, and then um, also I heard some of you kind of asking these questions as well during our break. So we're going to start with those, and then um, and then I'm going to and that's great. That's 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 the point of this event. You should be uh, talking and coming up. That's the that's why we all we're here. Um, we're going to start with those, and then um, and then I'd love to open up for questions of, of, our, of our audience, both online as well as um, in person. So the first question is, we talked a little bit about CPS, and I think you might be our best person for this, but um, I'm sure ever, everyone can kind of chime in or other people can chime in. So we talked a little bit about how you kind of bridge the role between CPS and law enforcement. So can you help us understand how CPS operates um, in, in a child abuse case, like what their job is versus what a law enforcement officer's job is in these cases? Okay, great, thank you for that question. Um, so the Child Protective Service job is, um, to meet our mission, is for the protection of the child. On the, and I'm, I'm speaking, um, not to take their shine, but from a law enforcement aspect with that background as well, um, traditionally, traditionally, um, our, the law enforcement job was to solve the crime. I'm sorry. <laughs> to, so, to, to solve the crime, make the arrest. We're, they, on that end, we were trying to get the suspect. Um, and traditionally, um, 20 years ago, when I was in patrol, um, we were not really centered, we were more centered on making the arrest than we were the services for the child, making sure that they have the services and ensuring that they cannot be reoffended again. So on the child protective side, um, we are jurisdictional, similar to law enforcement. However, law enforcement is criminal and child protective services is civil. So um, our, um, our access can be a, just a little bit different. So we are able to go in to the home and do a full thorough investigation of the entire family unit. Um, whereas um, in law enforcement, it's generally suspect based or incident based. So um, when we're going in, we're getting a comprehensive look at the child's living environment. Um, the jurisdictional foundation for Child Protective Services is that the offender must be a parent, guardian, and or someone traditionally responsible for the child's care. Um, if they do not fall within that, within that realm, we do not have jurisdiction to actually investigate. Um, however, um, there is a shift there is a shift where Child Protective Services has also um, gotten into doing investigations on um, educators, on teachers, um, on certain individuals, law enforcement officers, when they are um, the perpetrators as well. So when we're involved with a child, not only are we um, referring for a good and thorough forensic interview, which is when we refer to um, Claudia um, or a CAC for a forensic interview, um, but we're also able to um, ensure that other services are, are met. Um, <laughs> Okay, can y'all hear me better? Yeah. Okay, um, I'm sorry, I have a deep voice. Um, <laughs> so, um, so ultimately there are often times where Child Protective Services, um, I know everyone thinks, oh, they remove. 
they take the kids from the family. Um, and that's actually contradictory to our mission. The mission is to, um, to uh, make sure that the family can stay together as long as it's a safe environment for the child. Um, so you may have an offender where um, traditionally we did in the past, um, there were cases of neglect of supervision, sexual abuse, those type of things where um, the child may have been removed from the home. However, the offender is not in the home. They are not part of the home, but they are part of the family. Um, many of us know that there are, um, in Child Protective Services, we are very well trained and understand that there are, we deal with cultural differences, we deal with many differences that create those type of situations where it is difficult for the child to outcry, it's difficult for the child to talk. So. Um, what we do is we investigate to determine what is the best and safe, safest environment for that particular child at that time. Um, the removal is the absolute last resort. Um, we do not traditionally try to remove. Um, we can relocate to other family members if they have a protective capacity. Um, or we can um, work with the family depending on the level and severity of the abuse, neglect, and or exploitation um, to see if it was something intentional, unintentional. Um, in those investigations, um, we gather information that oftentimes, um, as you see um, through the MDT process, and um, I'm very happy we're here because I came in at a time, I worked in law enforcement in a time where we hated CPS. Um, <laughs> I'm sure the law enforcement officers on here remember those days um, where we hated CPS because we didn't understand. Um, law enforcement didn't understand and then CPS were frustrated with law enforcement because we thought they should do more. Um, with bridging that gap, we're able to gather information, communicate the information by taking out the lingo and ensuring that all parties understand each aspect of the investigation. Um, and then also there are often times where um, if CPS remains involved, they, the child will often outcry or provide additional information um, where in, it used to be where you would have to subpoena the information at all times. However, through the MDT and the changes in legislature that have come through that, we're able to share information more openly to ensure that there is a full and comprehensive criminal and civil investigation. Thank you. Um, you know, this, this brings me to uh, something that I want to make sure that we all kind of understand because it, it's a lot of information, right? So um, before CACs were this standard and this model, um, when a child would make an outcry of abuse, oftentimes CPS and law enforcement operated very differently from one another. Um, they weren't communicating with one another. Um, if a report was made to CPS, sometimes that information from that report wasn't quickly communicated or even ever sometimes communicated to law enforcement and vice versa. If someone called the police to report an allegation of child abuse, sometimes the police were not communicating the information to CPS. And I think that's where our folks from the CAC might be able to um, maybe elaborate a little bit more on the, on the CAC model. And um, maybe you can tell us how the CAC operates to connect law enforcement and CPS together to assure that these child victim cases are comprehensive. But then also I was hoping maybe you could talk to us a little bit more about what a forensic interviewer does. Um, because I think it's really interesting to hear that you know you have law enforcement who's talking to our perpetrators, right? CPS who's talking to the family members and the caregivers. Um, the DA's office is talking to everyone, right? Um, but someone's talking to the child as well, and that person traditionally works at the CAC. So if you could tell us a little bit more about how the CAC kind of bridges that gap, and then also what the interviewer does, um, I think that'd be great. Definitely, can you hear me? 
Is this working? Okay, wonderful. Yes, so let me give you a little bit of the history, right? Like in the 70s and the early 80s, there was no children advocacy centers. It did not exist. What happened is everyone was conducting their own independent investigations and unintentionally revictimizing children because they had to go through repeated duplicative interviews of the same allegation. Let's say a child disclosed at school, they would get interviewed by the teacher, and then they get sent to the counselor, and then the school nurse, and then the principal gets involved, and then they call the ISDPD, and then CPS gets involved if it's a caregiver or a family member in the home in charge of caretaking of that child, which really resulted in six plus interviews of one child about the allegation, which was significantly impacting criminal cases and children were recanting abuse or were also their statements were being contaminated by repeated questioning and the characteristics of the interviewer regardless, right? I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the 80s and the daycare cases that came of that was where there was a lot of allegations and investigations where children were disclosing, but they were being interviewed not only by investigators, also by well-intentioned counselors because they were the ones that had the initial rapport with children. However, through research and time, what that led to was innocent people serving time in prison for crimes they did not commit. And we have to be very careful of that because out of that approach came about forensic interviewing, recognizing that there has to be a specialized field that interviews children and that has the proper training to really question children in a manner that is legally defensible and not only supported by research and practice, but that also is fact finding in nature and that it stands in court if it ever makes it in that way. But also we serve as another professional in the investigative process that can testify on behalf of the child to support them because it is di very difficult to investigate child abuse cases. Why? It is rare when there's evidence. It is rare when a child sits in front of me pregnant. It is rare when you have a child that has a sexually transmitted infection. So most cases are he said, she said, a he said, he said. And most people tend to believe an adult. Most people prefer to ignore or believe that these crimes happen that children are heard by people that they love and by people that are close to them, right? Because people aren't supposed to hurt children. And unfortunately, that is a sad reality. And we have to have measures in place that tries to maximize the competence of that child to really allow them to provide details of an experience that they might have lived through. With the Advocacy Center movement, it came out in 1985. The first Children's Advocacy Center was in Huntsville, Alabama, the National Children's Advocacy Center. That is the motherland of the CACs, and that is really how we are modeled after. Forensic interviewing. When it comes to interviewing, we don't just get trained in how to interview. We're actually trained on a best practice approach and a protocol. At the Houston CAC, we follow the NCAC, the National Children's Advocacy Center, their forensic interview structure. That is based on research and practice, and it allows for it to be semi-structured. Every child in front of me is going to be different. I always tell my interviewers, you will never interview the same child twice for multiple reasons, and we have to keep that in mind every time we interview a child, even if it's the same child that comes back a year later for another victimization. With the forensic interview structure model, it is a phased approach. And nationally, that's what's best recognized to interviewing children. The stage one of the forensic interview structure is engagement. We are not just there to understand the child as a victim. We are there to show care, compassion, and understanding of how that child operates and how they understand questions. When we first come into the room as an interviewer, that is the first time that we're meeting a child. And how difficult is that to be in a room with a stranger with two cameras that, and everything's being recorded? We know that we have to meet children where they're at, but first we have to understand them and who they are. And that involves a neutral topic where we introduce ourselves and we get to know them. 
What grade are they in? What are some things I like to do for fun? And in that conversation, we build in guidelines because as interviewers, we talk very different. We talk very weird and we ask questions that no one else is asking and it could feel very different. So we set the parameters by being very transparent and letting them know of the guidelines in the room. And it's three of them. And one is, not only do I tell them that my job is to ask questions in the room, but also if I ask a question and you don't know the answer, it's okay to say, I don't know. I don't want children to guess. I don't want to, guessing is very suggestible territory and I do not want to go there if it's not fact finding in nature. If I ask a question that you don't understand, it's okay to tell me because as an interviewer, I might be pretty exhausted and not ask the best question that the child might not be understanding. So we practice and with examples to make sure that the child's understanding my guidelines. And if I make a mistake, it's important to correct me. And then I will make a mistake to see if they correct me. Research has shown that if we minimize suggestibility in the room, when we're talking about a neutral topic, by the time that we are in stage two, which is the allegation phase, a child is less likely to be suggestible. And we know that younger the child, the more suggestible they can be. And it is my job as an interviewer to ensure that my questions remain open and non-leading and fact-finding in nature only. After those guidelines, we proceed to a truth, lie, and oath, where in the state of Texas, we have to determine if the child can distinguish between telling the truth, telling a lie, and then taking an oath to only talk about true things in that room. We do that in a very developmentally sensitive way, right? A 13-year-old would understand it very different than a three-year-old. So we practice that approach in a different manner. And just so you know, if a child doesn't take the oath, that is okay. We still proceed. And the only thing that can happen is that can never be shown in court. But as you might hear, that is rarely ever shown in court. Once we do the oath, we proceed to what we call an event narrative practice. And that has to do with practicing telling me of an event that's neutral in nature, but I'm episodic training. So episode, when you think of episode, Tell me about your last soccer game. I'm focusing the child's mind, memory retrieval, and language narrative on a specific incident of their life that has nothing to do with abuse. As an interviewer, I'm establishing their competence, their ability to narrate, but also to speak in specific terms rather than tell me about every time you, you play soccer. That is too generalized because in stage two, I'm gonna pull out specific incidents that are needed for the investigation. So then we're building the process of the interview. Once we understand their ability for an event narrative practice, we proceed to family composition. We wanna understand who the child lives with, who is close to that child, because I don't just wanna know about the allegation later. I also need to know if there's, there's been any possibility that they're victim of another type of abuse. So that information will be important for stage two. Once we transition to stage two, which is the substantive phase or the allegation phase, we ask in transition with a very open-ended question, tell me the reason that you're here today. And that is to allow the child to tell me in their own words, potentially if they're ready to talk, what has happened. But a lot of times that's not the case. So then we have to be prepared if a child just says, I don't know oh, I don't wanna talk about it. We are trained to then transition into the facts of the case that we know. If I know they went to the hospital and they disclosed to a professional, I can bring that in. But also I can't expect the child to go in there and just tell me everything right away. Sometimes they need more direction and they don't understand the parameters of a forensic interview. Once they begin either disclosing or not, my role is to gather all the facts of the case, understand everything that that child has lived through in their experience from beginning to end. When you think of who, what, where, when, duration, frequency, perpetrator, but also information that corroborates or, or partners can use to corroborate the abuse. And that includes sensory information. What could they hear? What could they see? What could they feel? What did that taste like? Think of all your senses, we're looking and asking for it. Once we're done exploring what we feel has maximized that child's ability to tell me about that one allegation, then we, as neutral parties, have to engage in an alternative hypothesis of abuse. Is there another possibility that this child has been coached, that this has happened, but someone else was the perpetrator? 
or are they victims of other type of abuse? Because research tells us if a child has experienced abuse before the age of 18, more than likely they've experienced poly victimization, other types of abuse. Once we go into those details of a child's disclosed, we transition into a global assessment of abuse, meaning we explore child pornography, domestic violence, drugs, uh, visits from the police to the house, visits from CPS caseworkers to the home. All of this is important for the civil case and for the criminal case. And then we take a break. When we take a break, the people that are observing live is law enforcement and child protective services in the adjacent room. And that is who I rely on and lean on to know if I've covered everything that they need. Because remember, child first. I want to prevent anyone else from having to talk to that child. So how do I get your needs met, partner, to ensure that I go back in there and ask anything else that I might, might have misstated or need to clarify to prevent them from having to come back? After that, we transition into body safety and inform children because not everyone has these conversations with children, that there are parts of the body that no one should touch. We review safe people in case that ever happens, who they can talk to, and then we transition into a neutral topic. I want to neutralize any emotion that I might have evoked, and my goal is to return the child in the same emotional composure or even better, because sometimes there is a release. In that protocol that we follow is an embedded social support. I am there to serve the need of that child. I do not force a disclosure if they're not ready and prepared. If a child is in distress, if a child is high, if a child does not want to talk about it, if a child is angry and violent, do you think they're going to tell me all of the details of their victimization in that moment? No. Then that is my opportunity to advocate to our partners. Today is not the day bring them back for a follow-up interview, or maybe this child needs an extended forensic interview where it's one interview stretched out in multiple sessions. So we offer that within our division as well. It truly does embody doing the right thing for children and working in a collaborative approach with our partners to, to get effective outcomes for the civil case, for the criminal case, but most importantly for the children. That was very helpful. Thank you. Um, and something everyone uh, should know is that, you know, the forensic interviewers, they are neutral, right? So their job is to maintain neutrality. They don't work for CPS. They don't work for law enforcement. They're there to get that testimonial evidence from the child. So they play a key role in the subsequent investigation of the case, um, but they're neutral to the investigation of the case, which, which is really an ideal situation for that child victim and also for the people that are involved in the investigation of the case. So thank you, it's very helpful. Um, okay, so now I have some questions for this side of the table. Um, a question that kind of came in, and I think this might have spurred from last night's um, panel that we, we had. Um, so we talked a lot about if you were there or you had an opportunity to see it online. If you missed it, don't worry, we're gonna put it up on our channel so you can, you can see it. I encourage you to watch it if you haven't. Um, so last night we talked about the dangers of the internet. Right, and this new internet exploitation of children and um, how this is kind of just the growing modality of crime victimization for kids. And we had a question come in that asked about kind of, can you tell us a little bit in, in ICAC, kind of as the Houston ICAC people, what the types of internet crimes against children are looking like? Like what types of cases you're working, what types of things you're seeing? Um, I'm thinking maybe it's, I think it might be as a result of last night's conversations, we're a little more aware that this may be happening. Um, and is there anything kind of specific or what is Houston seeing? Oh, you need a second to turn that on, no, don't you? I, oh, I left it on, it. I left it on. Uh, so the most cases that we get are going to be possession of CSAM material. So um, for those of you who don't know, legally uh, any electronic service provider has to monitor their platforms for any type of known CSAM material. Now a lot of them are even using AI to detect these um, types of images or videos that are being put out and when that happens they send it to the um, task force that the IP address for that upload occurs. 
Um, and so that's the vast majority of the cases that we get are possession of CSAM cases. We do get a lot of online enticement. So um, any of the communication platforms like Discord or even Roblox, Minecraft, they have uh, speech algorithms or text algorithms that look for specific uh, phrases or, or sentences that are said on there and they'll, they'll notify us of any type of potential online grooming or um, inappropriate, you know, conversations between what looks to be a child and what looks to be an adult. And then, like I said earlier, uh, the biggest one that is increasing most frequently is the sextortion, blackmail, enticement cases. Um, and, and the difficulty with those is for any of you that that aren't aware of those type of cases, these are a lot of times being committed by these organized crime groups overseas, um, which the FBI and HSI and some of our other federal partners kind of take the lead on, but they make them very difficult to prosecute and hold these people accountable. Um, but we do have a lot of, you know, students blackmailing other students, um, even at, in the middle school ages where kids are doing these things. So, uh, you know, and, and we, still, we still do get a lot of people online um, through our proactive uh, chat ops that, that those two down there probably have a lot more experience in, or peer-to-peer, or -peer, um, if any of you all are familiar with like BitTorrent or things like that. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's it, as, as time progresses, you know, the complexity of it just keeps going further because the platforms that, you know, kids are using, that young adults are using, that you all are using, uh, changes frequently. I mean, you know, five years ago, everybody's on Omegle and, uh, and Facebook, and now, you know, most people aren't on Facebook. They're, you know, most of the communication's on Discord or Snapchat or things like that. Um, so, as far as on the prosecution side, I don't know what y'all see the most of. So, we see a lot of situations where um, either kids start maybe in a relationship with someone, and then that someone maybe starts introducing them to things like drugs, or then using that to introduce them to, hey, I have this friend, he's got really, you know, nobody really likes him. If you're a good girlfriend, you'd go have sex with him. If you're a good girlfriend, you'll have sex with these other people. Sometimes it starts with, a, you know, a situation where someone's, t you know, where you're, th you think you're in a committed relationship and you start taking pictures right? You let your partner photograph you in the nude or doing acts together that you guys think were consensual at the time, but then you start getting emails from other people saying things like, I've got these photos of you. You need to send me more or I'm going to tell your parents. I'm going to tell your teachers. I have access to your all of your contacts on Facebook or Instagram. I'm gonna post these on a site. And what'll happen a lot of times with our kids especially is that they get trapped. They're afraid to get in trouble. They don't wanna tell their parents. They don't know what to do. And so they start sending pictures. And then we find it always escalates. It always escalates. And so part of what we do is, in addition to prosecuting those people that we find that have been on the other end of that, the ones that are asking for the information, that are uh, escalating the behaviors, is also to try to educate kids that when something like that happens, even if they have sent somebody a photo they shouldn't have sent, it's still very important to tell somebody because adults can step in and help kind of cut off what could get very worse. So, I mean, we have cases right now where we have f family friends who have identified kids come up with false profiles online, met them online, had conversations with them, and then said things like, well, I'm not, I won't send all of this information to your parents if you'll go have sex with your Uncle Bob, okay? Who do y'all think is the person chatting online? Uncle Bob, right? Kids, a lot of kids don't understand that when they're chatting with people online, that there's a pretty good chance that that person is not exactly who they say they are. And so, in those situations, because we, do, we don't have somebody in another country that we can't get access to, a lot of times it's someone in the kid's life. And those are the people that we're able to hopefully bring in and prosecute. 
Thank you. That is, um, it, it's so important, I think, to understand how these cases are are initially called in in terms of an allegation, and then all of the steps and the processes um, involved in that investigation. And think of this too in in collecting all of that evidence and information and data. There's also an element where there's constant and ongoing provision of services and caretaking for not only that child victim or victims, but also for the secondary victims. Right? Imagine being a parent of a child who makes an outcry and just feeling helpless and overwhelmed, right? So this team approach really um, really embodies that. I wanted to ask um, Tony and Brandon down on the end, if you could tell us a little bit more about what proactive investigations mean. You, you, you glazed over it a little bit when you started talking, but can you, can you tell everyone what a proactive kind of um, internet law enforcement investigation does? Sure. Absolutely. So uh, in essence, what it means for me and, and where I work is I go online and I pose in a profile as a young boy or young girl. That's why I kind of referenced I'm the hottest 12 or 13 year old girl online. Um, it's a necessity that we have to do because everything that we do proactively in these chat rooms or on these platforms that are common with kids is based on reality. We've all worked uh, real cases where real kids have been exploited um, in some manner or some fashion, or they've been enticed by someone online who has a desire to meet them for a sexual gratifying situation for them and puts that child in a vulnerable place. And so we base everything we do in an undercover capacity on that. And so it's, it's a really pretty simple process. We just go out there as a, a young kid. We do have very strict rules that we have to follow, and we are very, very uh, stringent on those rules and that we do follow those because we don't want to develop bad case law. We don't want to become, uh, you know, the United States versus Godwin. That would be a very terrible thing in the Supreme Court for me. And so I don't want to create future rules for future law enforcement uh, that they have to follow. So we are really strict on the rules. And so we just put ourselves out there. And it doesn't take long, I'll tell you. Most of young people in here could probably attest that um, it doesn't take long for something like that to happen and a communication to start. What we see online as far as grooming is, uh, while similar, it's much, much faster than it is in, in real life when it's a hands-on case. It just happens so rapidly. And so we troll around these different sites. We get contacted by people because the best case scenario is that they meet me versus a real child because we know they're meeting real children. I, I mentioned in our thing last night, I, I arrested a guy the night before last, before we came down here for doing very similar things. And so this is such a prevalent issue, it's very, very important. It's not easy. Not everybody has the ability to chat. I can tell you, honestly, in uh, North Texas, there's what, uh, five of us, maybe, that are doing that um, on a fairly consistent level. And that's just what I choose to do at this point. I, I still do all of the other things, uh, like Freddie said and Brandon said, with cyber tips and peer-to-peer -peer and uh, reactive cases, which is something we haven't, uh, we, we did talk a little bit about that, but I meant like parent reactive cases where they report something they've intercepted on their child's device or maybe for monitoring or an email or something uh, in addition to what comes in from the, inter the providers online. We also try to take some of our reactive cases, some of the cyber tips, and uh, turn those into proactive cases. So I have seen um, in one instance, I, I put a person in prison for a long time because he had posted a comment about abusing a child on YouTube uh, under a video. And so I acting as, um, and so as you've heard, we've talked about going and portraying ourselves as children. We've also portrayed ourselves as either a parent of or someone with access to children um, and making that child available. And as we say oftentimes, these things are based on real life cases. So people ask us, you know, why do you pretend to be a bad mom or a bad dad of, of a child and making them sexually available? Um, and that's because we've seen multiple cases of a female or a male who has access to children in their care, making them sexually available to strangers for either for money or just for their own sexual gratification. And so we portray those those as well. Um, 
two of my cases in Harris County came from me pretending to be a bad mom um, with access to kids, and one happened to be a cop, um, which to me, he wasn't a cop. He was just a predator with a badge who had made it through the system somehow and needed to be caught um, because we like catching those even more than just normal. Uh, and so we try and take everything we do and make it as much as we can centered on real life cases um, in judicious ways, you know, proceeding as carefully as possible, but trying to be focused on, and we say this a lot when we teach law enforcement, it's not about our arrest. The arrest is not the end of the case. It's the start of our work. Because if they're meeting Tony or me or another investigator, I'm not a real kid. So now my job is to go find out all of the real children that those predators are actually reaching out to and, and abusing. And oftentimes what we see is we're just the one that got them into into our spotlight. And there are almost every time real children that they have or are abusing, and our job is to then, in a trauma-based, victim-based model, to seek out those real kids and bring those children for restorative um, source services. Um, so I have cases ongoing now where we have turned online cases into real cases of hands-on abuse of real children. And so ultimately, that's for us, I think the most fulfilling thing that we can do because, you know, we take something where it's just me and, and this predator who have been talking, but now we find they're real victims and we, we pull them out of that abusive situation and ultimately that's what we're all hoping to do. So uh, I think that that's something that we try to focus our efforts on, especially when we're teaching others about how to do this job, is to start the, the look for the real kids once we've brought them into the spotlight. Okay. Um, thank you. I, that's so helpful. And it's so interesting too. If you have, if you're interested in hearing about some of the, the cases that they've worked, their podcast is also a great resource. I actually use it in my classroom for teaching um, purposes. It's really good education for, um, for parents, for, um, you know, students that are interested in seeking these types of careers, really good information. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Mr. Villano at this point. Um, and by the way, round of applause for, uh, for Mr. Villano here. Uh, without him, <laughs> without him in his center, um, we wouldn't be able to have these, these functions. And he really, he's this, the person behind the scenes that makes sure everything goes really smooth and that we can have all these great guests on campus. So I appreciate him so much. He's going to let, um, we're going to have some audience questions now from, from y'all. So if you guys have questions, just hands up. Um, and if you want to tell us who you want to direct them to, don't be shy. I know y'all have questions because I heard you guys up here earlier. So go ahead. Okay. So I, before we start, I want to lighten it up a little bit. And I want to tell you that, you know, a lot of times when you go to school, you study one thing and then you end up doing something else for your career. So I want to, I want you to tell me, shout out what you think this fella here did before he became a child exploitation officer. What's that? What? What do you say? What'd you say? Librarian. Librarian. Nope. Jazz musician. Nope. Anyone else? High school coach. Houston City? He used to, you knew. Yes, Brandon used to, he worked and he, he worked as an opera singer and he studied opera before his, this career. So. Equally as interesting as a librarian. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you could start in one thing and end up in another. So just uh, be encouraged by that. Okay, so questions. If you have a question, I'm going to come around so our audience online uh, can hear the question. So who has a question? Dr. Pohl. So I want to piggyback on something that Dr. Gilmore says. You know, sometimes the parents is the last person to know. Usually they go to the to their teachers, their coaches, their counselors, the social worker in the school. So can you tell us a little bit more what do you see in the schools and what are some of the, th what are some of the things that we teachers 
should be aware of when it comes to child abuse and what we should be looking for at the school level. So anyone? Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about schools. I'll say this about schools. I find that teachers are wonderful when kids make disclosures of abuse to them. Teachers are wonderful. Um, I think one of the things that frequently happens though at schools is that we see a lot of situations where a kid tells their teacher, you know, my stepdad did something bad to me or, or whatever. And then that teacher will then go take the kid to the counselor. And the counselor will say, tell me what happened to you. And the kid will have to say for a second time what happened to them. And then the counselor will call the principal. The principal will call them in and say, what happened to you? Do you see how many times that kid is having to talk about what happened? And that is not what's best for our kids. We all, uh, there's science that backs it up, that the best thing to do, as soon as a kid makes a disclosure, even something as simple as my stepdad is doing stuff to me I don't like, is to set them up with a forensic interview. That is the gold standard. That gives that kid an opportunity to kind of get themselves together. They're able to go into a very child-friendly place and do the interview. It's recorded. So now, all of those people who want to know what happened can watch that forensic interview. They don't have to come in and keep asking this child over and over and over again what happened. So whenever I'm talking to teachers about their role in this whole process, I tell them, as soon as you believe that you need to make a report to CPS because you believe that some child is in danger or has, an ex has experienced abuse, make that call. I think a lot of times teachers are concerned. They don't want to, um, they don't want the kids to think that somehow they're telling on them or something like that. But it's very important. And once they make that call to Children's Protective Services, Depending on how Children's Protective Services ranks that call, it is likely that that child could be in a foren forensic interview potentially even that same day or at least within three days. It isn't something that it can take weeks and weeks and years to get to. So I always encourage teachers, if that's the role that you're in, especially if you're in some of these school districts who maybe have a little bit more bureaucracy and they want you to bring the kids to all of those people, understand you don't have to. Make the call, let the child get to an agency like our Children's Assessment Center where they can have a child-friendly, trauma-informed interview. It's, it's really important. So if I could piggyback on it too real quick. Um, you know, we're, we're all very fortunate here in Harris County because we have such a great CAC, we have such great partners, Dallas is similar, um, but not everywhere is like that. And not all school districts are like that, not all school resource officers know how to work these cases, not all even local police departments know how to work these cases. They're, they're difficult, they're, you know, they're on the technology side, they're very sophisticated a lot of times. And unfortunately, you still get you know, victim blaming or just uh, kind of like a push off to the side of like, oh, oh, there's nothing we can do about it. So one of the things I always um, really strongly push forward is just the education and knowing the resources that are out there. Um, and the one I always push is NITMIC, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Um, because we have these federal task forces that are set up to deal with these crimes that if your local law enforcement agency doesn't know how to deal with it, you can go through NITMIC and they will get you in touch with an agency that can and then get you those resources. So yeah, you might be in, you know, let's say Chambers County, they don't have a big CAC, but if this is a really big case, they can reach out to us and use leverage our resources to help. Um, so that's kind of one of the things I always push is like, don't just stop. If your local place is saying, oh, there's nothing we can do, or you're local, you don't have a CAC in wherever county you're working in or living in, uh, you know, keep going, push it further. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. If I can, um, <clears throat> the, the one thing that I would tell educators is don't stop that child from talking to you. 
Oftentimes, um, in the, our investigations, we will often see where an educator says, oh, the child started to tell me something and I told them, stop, I let, me, let me do what I need to do. Be ready to be uncomfortable and get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Let them talk to you. You may be, even though all of us are involved, that may be the only, you may be the only person that they trust enough that they are willing to, to tell. So you can make, of course, you're going to make the report. You don't have to ask the questions, but allow those children to speak to you. Be open enough to listen to things that are not going to be comfortable to hear. And when you make a report, report exactly what they told you. We often get, which I think it's just habit as we get older, we often want to use the technical terms of what a kid tells us. I don't want to hear a technical term because a child is not going to come up to you more than often and say, I've been sex trafficked. That's not going to happen. They're going to come to you and say, I did this and this person paid me $20. That's what we need to know. It's okay. Um, as an educator, remember that not only you can, but you are mandated to make the report. Not your principal, not your counselor. You are mandated by law to make that report. So make the report. It does not matter if, if 10 people call in the report. We don't care. We don't care but make sure that you take that liability off of yourself as well. But beyond the liability, do the best thing to keep that child safe by making the report. Um, and then the third and final thing I would say is making sure that as educators, that as you develop though, that rapport and those relationships with, your ch with the children, in your class and you see actions, reactions, or you see behaviors change, oftentimes we often, often see it disciplined immediately. We see the acting out disciplined without finding out the why. So you can get a child to open up to you completely by instead of seeing just their action on the surface, saying, I've noticed that there has been a change in your behavior, is there something that is going on? Many times they're gonna say no at first. I have a teenager, I know she doesn't talk to me about anything. <laughs> um, but many times they will circle back around because you've opened the door. So, Leave that door open when you see those actions. Sometimes let them know that you see the actions. And I know that there are some disciplinary actions that must be handled immediately. But if there is a gradual change or a sharp change in behaviors, recognize those things and possibly look at them as not necessarily a disruption of the educational process, but more of there is something deeper that this child may be experiencing that I need to explore. I'd like to reinforce what our prosecutor friend said and, and what has been said here in something that we've been teaching educators across the area for the last decade. It's a, lighten of your, a lightening of your burden you are oftentimes the strongest ally for the child, and that's why they trust educators to come forward and tell them something that is the deepest, darkest secret that they have. I wanna take the pressure off of you by saying, though, while listening to what they say is extremely helpful and being supportive and starting that report, it's not your job to investigate. It is not your job to ask questions and determine whether there's evidence, gather statements and things like that. Your job is to listen and then stop and tell them, thank you for telling me this. I'm going to send you to someone who can help you with this because we see sometimes people, well-intentioned adults moving into their investigative mindset. I've got to prove this before. The law says, a suspicion or a, a, a belief of abuse. That means if a child says someone touched me, 
that's enough for you to say, I'm making a report to CPS, and then it stops because, and I'll give you a real world example. We had a well-intentioned police officer ask a question. The, the child came in with her mother. The question was, was there penetration that the, that the officer asked? And the child in front of her mother said no. But when they go to the professional, the forensic interviewer, of course, the child's telling everything that happened, and there was. And a defense attorney in trial used that misstatement to question the child, and it all resulted in an acquittal of a sex offender, already sex offender registered, because of one bad question asked by someone who should have stayed in their lane. So that's the thing we tell teachers a lot, is I'm going to relieve you of the burden of having to investigate whether this is true or false. It's not your job. Let the professionals that know how to do that do that. And your job is to, which I think is a, every educator's one goal is to just be the ally of the child and be their support for them. I think you bring up a great point, Brandon, um, is that, um, and I think there, this was also mentioned by you, is that um, don't be surprised as an educator if a child tells you something um, because they trust you that totally, it, it takes the, the, the breath out of the room, right? Um, but be prepared again, to be very calm, um, because another, th something that I've seen professionally is um, I had a child make an outcry to a, it wasn't a teacher, it was a sports coach, but it was such a intensive information that they said, um, and it was a one sentence outcry for, it wasn't graphic details, it was a one sentence outcry, but it was so uh, intensive that the coach broke down into tears and the child didn't wanna talk to anyone else because they were afraid of, like certainly they can't tell their parents, they don't wanna, so if a child does come to you as their outcry, um, know too that that's a very brave thing for them to do and this idea too of, of listening to that information, being prepared to you know, stomach something that you may not be able to and then thanking them for telling you I think is really important because it reinforces that kid's not in trouble, right? They didn't do anything wrong and now Again, the, the team is gonna take it from there. We said we had a question over here? Yeah, okay. Not loud enough, I think. No, hold on, hold on, hold on. It might be just so we can get you on the, uh, I don't like the mic, but okay. Uh, one question, um, once, uh, first, thank you all for sharing your expertise with us. Uh, I think we really appreciate it. Uh, but we get to, we got to hear the action of after the child has got or been exploited. What are we doing for the prevention, for the educating the parents, educating uh, the educators, and educating the children themselves to when you are being put in this position to prevent it, to keep going further? That is a wonderful question. And I will say as a CAC, it is our responsibility to take on prevention as well. And I will tell you, uh, our executive director is here and that has been one of her biggest goals to not only step in when the child needs us because they're a victim or there's an allegation against them, but what are we doing to prevent it? And how are we only taking on educating not only the professionals who are mandated reporters, but the children as well. We have a huge training department within the CAC that doesn't just train in-house or virtual, but we go out in the community. And that means schools, churches, places where parents are, we offer all types of education regarding what to do, what it means, but also how to look out and how to understand changes in your child's behavior, changes in your child's demeanor, what it could mean, how to react, and what it could look like. Because we also have to equip parents on how to properly respond, but how to properly select their significant other, right? How is their previous trauma potentially impacting their current decision making that then exposes their child to potential victimization? It is in prevention. And you can see through the website of the Children's Assessment Center all of the effort that is taken on to really teach and educate the community in Harris County and the community overall that can log in to any of the virtual trainings that we provide. Can, can I piggyback off of that for a second? Um, one of the things that we try to do on the law enforcement side, uh, obviously we rely on our CAC resources tremendously because uh, we don't have the huge training 
groups that they do, and so they can help offset some things. But because uh, part of our task force model is to do continued education and do public uh, awareness. So for us, for Brandon and I, we teach uh, law enforcement all over the country. We've been all over the world, but primarily here in the U.S. And so what we try to do when we go for a week, say, to Utah, where we're going to train a bunch of cops on how to do this job, we also try to give back to the community. We also try to set up uh, a meeting like this and try to pack it as much as we possibly can, you know, a couple of hundred people. And so we do these as a way to raise awareness, to educate people, to change the paradigm, change the thinking process of what kids think is normal, sharing nudes, which is not normal, and changing that behavior pattern because we have to get foundational with it. The problem with us in the law enforcement community is we know we cannot arrest our way out of this situation. This is a humongous problem. It's prolific across the globe. And so we have to do better and we have to continue to raise that awareness and that's what we try to do. What small part we can do, I know Brandon speaks a lot, I speak a lot in my community and any community that will ask, we could talk the paint off a wall, I promise you. Uh, especially Brandon, he really could talk. Uh, the point is we try to do this as often as we possibly can. It is a statistic that we report monthly through the ICAC, and so it goes nationally, and, and those are things that monies get geared towards uh, funding a, additional programs. Start a podcast. That's what yeah, start a podcast. <laughs> I right, will so tell I you, too, um, that there's not a person on this panel that – I, and I, I, don't, I don't know most of these folks professionally. Um, I just met most of them today. But I will tell you, um, I won't even look, that I know I will get a nod of agreement that they all wish they could work themselves out of the profession. They, every single person here wishes that their position didn't have to exist, that they did not have to be, did not need, how many forensic interviewers do you, are you over? over? Seven full-time full interviewers that are interviewing kids every day. Um, they wish they didn't have to do that. Um, and so I, even on campus, some of my interns, where's Kimberly? Okay, I have interns right now that are with partnering with the CAC doing outreach and prevention in the schools. But I think the biggest thing is what we have here, right? Is you guys here that are coming and engaging and listening to this incredibly important content, being inspired by what you hear and then going out and Oh, having these conversations. We have tough conversations with our kids about other things that are kind of scary, right? Weren't we just telling our kids not to touch their eyes and their faces and their no because they could get a virus and spread it and make their grandparents sick, right? Why aren't we just doing that? Don't we teach our kids how to be safe during fire drills and gun safety? So if we can have those conversations. We should have conversations about body safety. So great question. All right, I have some questions online that I'd like to get to. Um, this one is for uh, Ms. Nichols. Uh, how many of the crimes do you attempt to get plea bargains on? And what are your, your views on plea bargains when it comes to child? No, um, actually, predators. That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, it's a good question. Um, I will say that we make a plea offer in every single case. Um, it is almost always better for us to be able to dispose of a case without a kid having to come into court, get cross-examined by a defense attorney, and there is always the potential that a jury can hear everything and still find a defendant not guilty. So that is something that is kind of always in the back of our minds when we are dealing with our criminal cases. Um, that being said... Sometimes the plea offers that we make are 40 years in prison without parole and stuff like that. Um, it, it really depends on the case. We do try to let the families um, participate with us in the plea bargaining process. I, I tell every prosecutor that I supervise, we should never be making an offer of punishment to a defendant if the family it does not know about it, has not been um, discussed it has not been discussed with them. Now, at the end of the day, we have, we're have we sort of bound by the Texas Penal Code as far as what we can give in any particular case. Some of our cases are third-degree felonies, where we're looking at somewhere from probation to 10 years in prison. Some of our more serious cases, 
we're looking at a punishment range of 25 years to life in prison without parole. Um, so one of the things, I think plea bargaining is just that, it's a bargaining process. There are positives to being able to control the outcome. For example, if I can guarantee that somebody would spend a considerable amount of time in prison and have to register as a sex offender when they get out, those are positives for me. Um, if I have a case maybe where a complainant is not really comfortable with the proposition of testifying, because we do have that. We have lots of cases where kids, um, you know, for whatever reason, don't feel like coming to court and testifying is the best outcome for them. On one hand, I am never going to make a survivor of child sexual abuse come into court and testify if he or she is not fully on board with that. That is never going to happen. However, in most of our cases, because as I think somebody said previously, there's very rarely any physical evidence. It's usually a he said, she said, or she said, she said, or I can't get all the, all the but I mean, there it usually is the testimony of the child. That's usually the evidence that we have at court. And so if we have a situation where that child is not willing to, willing to testify, then maybe I have to see if, um, could I get the defendant to, get a, to go on probation? I don't love probation, but on the positive, at least if he's on probation, I can control where he lives for the next 10 years. I can make sure that he doesn't have any contact with any minors by himself. I can make him get sex offender counseling and hopefully prevent him from abusing anybody else. And as a as part of that, he also usually has to register as a sex offender. So there's a lot of things that go into the plea bargaining process. Um, like I said, we have 36, 3,662 cases as of Wednesday. I want you guys to take a, to just take a minute and imagine if each of those trials takes three days, how long it would be for us to try every single one of those cases. It's not possible. So we do have to engage in the plea bargaining process. Um, hopefully, we're able to do it in a way that we're able to get significant prison time and accomplish the goal of keeping the community as safe as possible. Thank you. All right, to the catfish cops, there's uh, um, someone saying, I was recently made aware that the game my young son plays known as Roblox had hidden sex sites within the system. I was able to type in Seuss Cat, S-U-S Cat, and I located them. How is your team working to identify these embedded sites within video games, and how can parents find out this type of information? Sure. Um, well, I mean, there. I said last night, our, our favorite federal agent is Special Agent Google. So Special Agent Google tells you a lot of information about things that you want to know. Um, I would say that there are too many things for us to know all of them. You know, we're on a lot of platforms, and we're old men that don't know everything about technology that the, even the kids do. Uh, but the one thing I'll say that we have discussed and had conversations with those large companies, Roblox, TikTok, the, the big companies, and they are trying to, some of them are trying to proactively stop exploitation and abuse on their platforms. And so the most powerful tool that a parent has besides educating their child and monitoring their activity is reporting those things to the platform when they find it. The platform has the legal, as, as Fred said earlier, the legal responsibility to report those things to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children where it will be sent out to a task force for investigation and potential prosecution. Um, but if they don't know about it and we don't know about it, then it can't be addressed. So the report abuse button on most platforms is the first step after educating and taking the proactive steps you, you have available as a parent to protect your child in person. The report abuse step is, is the most powerful tool in your toolbox. I, I can add just very quickly. So when it is brought to our attention, uh, it's not a bad thing for us because I'll give you a real world example. I had a complaint come in about a child who was groomed on a, on a gaming system uh, through a game called Overwatch, which is just kind of an animated first person shooter game. And so I, I literally was going to turn that into a proactive position where I was going to go online posing as a kid, a friend of this person. 
I'm going to play video games. And so I literally went to my chain of command and I was like, hey, I need a PlayStation 4 and I need the headset and I need this. And, and they were like, what? And I was like, it's for work. It's to save children. And so they were like, we better not get hit for any overtime for this. But I, I did get the gaming system. I did get the game. Um, I was terrible at the game. I realized very quickly uh, how how poorly I was playing because I was being told by 11 and 12 year olds just how terrible I was. So I had to, Some of them are ruthless. yeah, they are ruthless. It's brutal what they said to me. And uh, yeah, it's been a long way since Atari. So I, the honest truth, I brought my son to the station and I was like, hey, get me to this level. I need to be at this level in order to do this. So go kill all these characters or whatever. And so he got me to the level and within three days I was in that room with that predator and was able to make a case on that. So that, that's one of the things we do. Oh yeah, let me give you one other example. One of my own officers came to me and said, hey, uh, my daughter has this app and it was called Dog Sim. D-O-G-S-I-M, and it's basically like you go create a little animal, it's for very young kids, uh, you know, a dog of your choice, and you walk around a little neighborhood, and you like go up to people's doors, and they feed you food and drink water and all this, and he said his own daughter, who was, I think, six at the time, um, was solicited by somebody in a chat in that, in that game. I had never even heard of it, and I was like, he's like, he's ready to go find the guy, you know, burn his house down but uh i was like let me look into it and sure enough platforms that we think and applications we think that are geared towards very young ones and we see this with minecraft we see this with roblox we see this with so many other systems but those are ways when they're brought to our attention we do what we have to do to save kids and if you're a predator on these platforms, we're on there looking for you. So, uh, look, uh, that's a threat because we're looking on those platforms. There are cops across the world on those platforms looking for you who want to hurt kids. And that's, I mean, you're not going to know it until you get the handcuffs, hopefully. Any other questions in the room? Okay. The, inter the interview gets into small chunks because they cannot take like a long one. When, like, I was, a, I'm curious about it being contraproductive because like they're kids and they can't forget. And I also wanted to know like if it's in different chunks. I guess that they are like every now and then, like in a day, in a week. So like if like they have to go back to whatever they're being like abuse or something, like in case they are? Your curious mind is in the right place because we have to consider some of those things, right? As I mentioned, the one interview is really what is supported but in the 90s, but pretty quickly uh, everyone realized that one interview isn't the best fit for everyone. And when I say an extended forensic interview is the model that I'm referring to, it's still one interview separated in multiple sessions. And that is depending on the family's needs because we already know they're already in distress. It's gonna be a financial impact to take time off work, to come to our center and do it multiple times. So all of that is taken into consideration. It is still one interview that is done. And so it's not duplicative in nature. We follow the model that I mentioned earlier and then we stop there and then we come back and then we continue there followed with the guidelines. So they are not asked, even in a one-time interview, we are not allowed to ask the same question over and over again because then that is leading and then that is that can be perceived as suggestible. So our practice is to engage the child based on what they need, whether that be one session or two to three sessions, it depends. The model could be anywhere from three to five sessions to complete, but it could just be done one time when the child comes back. It depends where they're at in their disclosure process and our partner's ability also to be present and to get their needs met for their investigation as well. And we sometimes have situations because it's often years before a case goes to court so we often have cases where by the time kids have come to us and we're prepping for court, they have worked very hard to put what happened to them behind them. They don't, haven't thought about it on a daily basis. And so we do have situations where they'll come in and say, you know, I don't really remember it the way I remembered it the day that I had my forensic interview. So in those situations, you have to kind of do a balancing act, right? How 
On one hand, I can show them the video and that might refresh their memory so that they can testify. But then at the other side, I'm showing them that video that's all, probably gonna be pretty traumatic for them. So we really try to work with their parents um, and the rest of kind of the multidisciplinary team to make a determination about when we would show the kid their own video. Um, because sometimes it could be helpful for them, but sometimes it could be too traumatic and just not worth it. All right, and this will be the last question as we, okay, I guess this will be the second to the last question, okay. I was wondering if any of your organizations were open for interviews for like upper level students, uh, if you had any summer inter internships or anything of the sort available. I can, I can speak for the Children's Assessment Center. We do offer internships for master level students in social work, master level students in counseling, but however, we also offer within the activity center where, where it's where the children wait, bachelor level students. So there's different layers, divisions have different parameters that we follow, but we believe that it starts with students. We believe y'all are our future colleagues, and we know that there is no masters in forensic interviewing. So how am I getting the word out? It's through reaching our interns. And I'm proud to say we see interns as our colleagues because we trust them with doing the work that we are doing. So we have uh, internship opportunities for family advocacy and they're meeting directly with the caregivers. There's different ways that we interact with the students and the interns and then we follow the parameters of the school and also provide supervision along the way for anything that's needed during the, the internship experience. All right. Thank also, with the Texas Department of Family Protective Services, you are able to do to apply for um, internships. Um, they're generally done during the summer, um, but there are internships. Um, as far as um, being available for interviews, um, you can. Um, I will gladly volunteer any of my special investigators. They may kill me afterwards, but I'll volunteer um, every last one of them um, to. Um, um, you can reach out to us and we would definitely be happy to sit down with you and speak with you about um, the agency as a whole um, and the breakdown of the agency. All right. And was there one final question here? Um, in the situation where the abuser is the sole income earner, what type of like legal resources and like counselor and services are offered to that parent? So as a family advocate, I'm the one who gets to meet with the caregivers, right? In a lot of these cases, we do see that the sole provider is a perpetrator. Um, so during our session, uh, so how many social workers do I have here? So if we're looking at Mos Moslow's hierarchy needs, right? Because we need to make sure that their basic needs are met before we can even start talking about other things. So during that one-on-one -on -one initial session with the caregiver, I tell them, how are you doing today? Right, because I want to know what's on their mind. And if they tell me, you know, I'm, I haven't even processed what happened because I'm, thinking about paying the rent, electricity, or bills, then we try to give them um, just resources within the community, but as well, the CAC, we do have grocery uh, gift cards, we have gas cards, and we do have a wonderful rainbow room where we are able to provide caregivers with either clothes, just basic necessities, right, toiletries, or other things that the children need as well. And then try to contact them with whether it's Baker Ripley, or um, we as well work with uh, Children's Court Services, another program that could offer other community services, or whether it's a shelter. Okay, so ma making sure that those basic needs are met before we even talk about other things. Because at the end of the day, if the caregiver is more concerned on those basic necessities, we cannot provide anything else. Once that has been met, we talk about therapy. We do have a great therapy program there, as uh, Claudia had mentioned earlier. And we start by scheduling a clinical assessment two weeks after the forensic interview. After that, then, the referral would be sent to the therapy department as well. We have a wonderful program called Baso a Baso, or Getting Started, which is strictly for caregivers. And it's a psychoeducation group once a week where we talk about 
the perpetrator, managing feelings, loss, and reactions, because in a lot of these cases, the sexual abuse perpetrator is either gonna be a family member or someone close to the family. And at the end of the day, not only does this uh, trauma affect the child, but it affects the entire family dynamic system. Hey, very quickly, can I add one thing to that? We, uh, at this, this year's Crimes Against Children conference, uh, for the last two years, Brandon and I have uh, hosted our podcast there as a sponsor. And we met a woman uh, this year and we interviewed her. There's an interview on our, on our show with that. And her uh, company is called Room Redux. And what they do is they will come in absolutely free of charge and they will do a complete makeover on a child's room especially if that's where that trauma took place. I mean, it's a fantastic program. She was like a very inspiring lady, and they have just places all over the state. I know a lot of CACs work directly with them, so I just wanted to give them a little plug because uh, it was news to us. We didn't know that that existed, and uh, we just thought it was really tremendous. Brandon knows everything. Well, I, had a, I had a case where the, the, the CAC completely renovated and remodeled the child's room where the abuse happened. And to give this child a safe place to go back to where she didn't have to, she and her brother didn't have to remember what happened there. It was suited to their therapeutic needs as well. Uh, that to me was probably the best takeaway from the entire case. I wanna add something before we wrap up and that is that we can only do this work as long as we take care of ourselves. Constant do the pitch for self-care, right? Vicarious trauma, though, is a very real thing. Upon the moment that I am considering hiring someone or bringing an intern on, I'm having that conversation from the beginning. So as you're considering joining us in this effort or in this field, no, as that lady shirt says over there, self-care is not selfish. And as clinicians, when we say we can't pour from an empty cup, we really cannot. And you have to prioritize your needs to better be able to provide services to the clients that need us. You have to be in good shape. You have to be taking care of yourself and leaning on each other. As a team in forensics, as a team, as a multidisciplinary, we hold each other accountable for our roles, but also for checking on each other. Are you okay? How can I help you? What do you need from me? What does support look like for you? And that is how most of us have probably been able to get through this many years in this field. So it's really important that you begin that journey now of taking care of yourself because in the future, you might be taking care of others that really need you. That is such a good and important note to end on. Um, I think that the... I remember my personal experience working in this field and you know it it can really take a toll on you but it can be some of the most honorable work you will ever do. Um, I will tell you I have not interviewed a child victim in 16 years and very very recently I was at my local grocery store and a woman came up to me and she said Beth and I said, oh, I didn't know who she was. And I thought it was like someone from my kid's school class. And I was about to have one of those awkward mom moments. And I, when I said my name, she just grabbed me. And she actually, I had like bruises. I bruised like a peach. But, you know, she bruised me because she hugged me so tight. And she said, you don't remember you interviewed my son. Do you remember you interviewed my son? She said, ever since I came to that advocacy and all the work that you guys did, I, I will never be able to repay. And she wouldn't let go of me. She's sobbing. So the work that you do when you work in these fields, whatever trajectory you choose, the impact that you have on the people that come to you for help and for services will resonate with them for the rest of their lives. It's a very, very powerful thing to be able to be in any of these positions, um, to be able to help those most vulnerable populations and for those individuals to trust you with something that is probably the worst and most egregious, most awful thing that has ever happened to them in their lives. So it's a very honorable thing to do. Um, I'm gonna wrap up. I know um, we all had some great questions. We tried to get to everything online. I know we couldn't get to everything, but I appreciate everyone's attendance. I'm incredibly grateful for our panel. 130 plus years of investigative experience. Um, it's it's absolutely overwhelming um, 
to see this and to be here. Again, thank you so much to the center. Uh, Mr. Villano, we are so grateful that you were able to host this event for us and get everyone here. Um, and, and thank you all for your attendance and for your attention, because collectively, we really can make a difference in the lives of children um, in not only Harris County, but you know all of our communities within the world. So thank you again for coming. I appreciate your attendance. And um, look for the other Vital Voices events, because I'm sure you will find them just as engaging. Have a good one.